This episode of Grilled by the Staff Canteen is sponsored by Westlands, the premier specialist British grower of microleaf, growing cresses, edible flowers, inspired leaves, sea herbs and specialty tomatoes. Visit www.westlandsuk.co.uk to find out more. Thanks for listening to Grilled by the Staff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of the Staff Canteen. And today I am talking to John Pantasak. Have I said that correctly? Yeah, Chantrasak. Okay, there we go. <laughs> he is the owner of um, Anglo Thai, um, which has uh, held pop-ups in numerous locations, uh, while him and his wife uh, Diz are looking for a perfect permanent site. I'm assuming you're still looking for a perfect permanent site, but I will talk more about that in a, in a sec. Um, and you're currently at Newcomer Wines, um, and you've just announced that you're doing lots of guest chef nights as well, just to make yourselves even busier through August and September with uh, chefs like Lee Westcott, James Cochran, Brad Carter. Um, when I asked him to tell me something that people might know not know about him, he would say that he's half Thai, half British, born in Liverpool and brought up in Wales, a true modern day citizen. So um, your heritage is definitely something we'll discuss more detail, in more detail during this podcast. Um, so I first met John a few years ago when he was head chef at Samsa and since stepping out on his own, he's made a real name for himself in the industry um, and his food is outstanding. So. Uh, Congrats on everything you've done so far. So, um, you also took part in a Great British Menu, so building on that industry profile and showcasing to the general public what a great chef he is. So, thank you for joining me, Ron. Thank, thank you very much for um, caressing my ego. You've been <laughs> quite an um, and also thank you because I know that you were celebrating your uh, wife Diz's 30th yesterday, so I appreciate the commitment uh, with Adhead if you do have one. So. <laughs> oh no, it's all, it's, yeah, it's all good. I think every day seems to be a bit of a work day at the moment, but I think probably a lot of people are in that situation right now. Yeah, no, but to be fair, it's nice to be going back full throttle after a few months of not really being able to do anything. So I'm assuming that it's it's a good busy, so... Yeah, definitely. It definitely feels nice to have some kind of like restaurant hospitality normality back in our lives. But it is kind of, um, as I'm sure everyone will appreciate, a lot of it adapting now and scrambling around and trying to make the best of the situation. Um, it definitely feels like you're doing twice the amount of work for maybe a quarter of the amount of reward. But um, it's still good and it's it's positive at the moment. And we're we're like really positive about that. Well, I'll, I'll come on to obviously coronavirus and everything like that in a minute. So uh, obviously we can't avoid that, unfortunately, but we will talk about everything that's happened with that. But um, I think so my first kind of questions and where I want to go with this is, is for people who don't know your background. Um, talk me through your uh, early career and, and why you wanted to be a chef and, you know, how you've come to the point that you're at now. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I've actually not been cooking for that long, I guess, compared to some of my peers in the industry. Um, I have a background in uh, economics and business. And prior to that, I was a musician. So I've kind of like weaved through a a few different channels before getting my way here. Um, But yeah, I I was a musician through like most of my teenage years and early 20s. Um, I studied economics and ended up kind of falling into some roles in the city doing that, maybe into my mid to late twenties. And around, yeah, around about seven, eight years ago, I just decided it wasn't for me anymore and packed up, left London, went and embarked on a bit of a road trip across the the United States. And during that time, I just spent most of it traveling around for restaurants and food and food related things and kind of felt that I had an affiliation with food, maybe a little bit more than just enjoying eating out and drinking. So decided to just kind of brainstorm the idea of maybe being in hospitality. Um, I was 27 at that time, so I wasn't really prepared to just kind of go straight into any old restaurant and say, can I have a job? Um, And actually, as luck would have it, I spoke to a friend in, in Bangkok and his um, his family hotel chain had partnered with uh, Le Cordon Bleu, so like the French academic um, course, and they were offering the same European course in Bangkok. 
um, it was from like ex Michelin star style French uh, chefs. And he kind of sort of inceptioned the idea into my mind that maybe I should move out to Thailand and, and enroll on the course and give it a go for a bit. So I, I ended up just doing that and loved it. Ended up working through various bits and bobs in, in Thailand for about 18 months and, and ended up at a restaurant called Nam working for David Thompson. And at the time, I think that was, that was like the, the number one restaurant in, in Asia on the world's 50 best or yeah. the Asia's 50 best list. And that kind of really opened my eyes to Thai cuisine properly. I'd spent a lot of time obviously in, in Bangkok by that point, kind of connecting with that side of my heritage. And I just felt it was something that I was really excited by, something that I really enjoyed. When I came back to London after about 18 months, um, David put me in contact with uh, a guy called Andy Oliver, who at that point was just about to open uh, a little known restaurant called Somsa in the back end of Clemson's Arch in London Fields that went on to do great things. Yeah, thank God he um, did. It was an amazing restaurant. Yeah. So I got, I kind of like took a bit of a convoluted route through it. Um, I didn't really have much experience at the time, but I kind of threw myself straight into it. And I think coming at those things at an older age, you sort of realize that you've had a few of your lives already and that maybe you're a little bit older than some of the younger kids but also you've got that life experience to maybe make you turn on to choosing the right decisions during those times. Um, so yeah, Andy and I just kind of like went at it pretty hard and Somsa turned into a, into like a a sort of mini success story at the time when we were doing the pop-up and through that, we were able to crowdfund for a permanent restaurant site and, and that restaurant site still exists today. I think it's, maybe four years old now. Yeah. So that's a really kind of like proud moment at that time when we managed to achieve that. Um, I think it's, it's probably the best Thai restaurant in the country. I love it there. I think the team is amazing and they do great things for the cuisine. Um, but yeah, I, I left Tomso about two years ago just to kind of go on and pursue my own, uh, my own itches to do <laughs> various bits and bobs. But yeah, that's, that's kind of like my story to yeah. date. Really um, interesting because obviously I talk to chefs day in day out and like you said you have come to it quite late. I don't speak to many chefs that start at that age who decides yes that uh, you know I want to go into into this industry. I definitely haven't met many who were musicians before. So <laughs> how quite a, um, it's quite an easy transition. Just sort of like very little pay for lots of <laughs> unsociable hours, plenty of drinking and pirate behaviour. Um, <laughs> And a lot of just kind of like self-made hustling to get things done. Yeah. And I, I was playing music and traveling and touring when I was from about 16. So it was kind of a uh, part of me from a young age. And I think that has helped me get to a fast track to where I am today with this career path, definitely. What did, um, you, used to, what did you used to play? I used to play the drums in the band. Okay. Kind of like an indie rock and roll band. But that's... Yeah, it was a really good time. But uh, uh, again, you sort of, you reach a moment where you realize that maybe you're not achieving as much as you need to at that time. And it was a different, difficult decision to close that door. And I didn't revisit music for a lot, a number of years afterwards, but um, it was, it was the right decision and it was good to kind of move on from that. And, and yeah, it's just a very creative industry. And I think like I've managed to find that now with food, which is, which is great. And it, it definitely ticks the boxes for like, that um that aspiration that i have to be creative in my life yeah and i, I liked that obviously i asked you what uh, uh, you know tell me about a failure not necessarily a deep failure but something and you did obviously say uh, not achieving or not staying within music but i liked that there's a positive that comes out of that so uh, yeah, yeah definitely i think at, at the time i was a young teenager that wanted to be a rock star and i think that was still my number one uh career choice at that time and probably i wouldn't mind it too much if it still was now, but you do have to make those hard decisions and accept when it's not going the way that you want it to. And I think actually closing one door, like people say, will open another uh, further down the line. And you just kind of have to, um, you just kind of have to have faith in yourself that you will be able to pick yourself up and do something, do something else. But like I say, I think all those different kinds of experiences 
help you to grow as a person and move on into doing other things uh, in other career paths. Do you still um, play now? Does your, does your wife have to listen to, to I, I do not. My, I have a drum kit that I refuse to sell. It's like the only thing left at my mum's house in Wales that sits under a bed in a spare room. Um, occasionally when I'm down there, I like dust it off and look at it and go, oh yeah, that was a good time. But no, I, haven't, I probably haven't played the drums in four or five years. Really? It's one of those things you wouldn't forget, but it's still, it's a very antisocial um, instrument to have set up, especially in a, in a small shoebox place in London. I do feel like that might test you to the limits, especially as we've just come out of lockdown. That could have been uh, quite intense. So Yeah, I think my neighbours already hate me enough, so I don't need that one added to it. <laughs> so, um, away from music, let's get back to food. Um, I know it's a question that chefs don't really like me asking, but what, what, what is your style, if you had to explain it, if you had to put it into words, to people that have not eaten your food, like how would you explain your style? Uh, to people yeah. who might be coming to um, Anglo Anglo Thai, yeah. So Anglo Thai kind of is the um, is the term that I use for the style of food that I cook. It was never intended to be a restaurant name. It just kind of floated out because mm-hmm. it made sense to people to kind of. I mean, just the fact that it has Thai in the word, I think, means it resonates in people's head that they're going to come and eat some form of Thai food but it just speaks about the two sides of my heritage. So my father's from Bangkok and my mother is originally from Cornwall. Um, so half British, half Thai. And I tend to cook food and dishes that I know from Thailand and recipes that I know from my dad's side of the family, but try and use as much kind of British provenance or British Isles provenance ingredients as possible to get that same flavor profile and end result. Um, Essentially, I, the belief for me is that Thai food is a, is a way of kind of balancing certain seasonings. And I think some of the more prominent flavors in Thai cuisine are sweet, sour, spicy, salty, and that you can achieve those kind of flavor profiles from domestic ingredients within the British Isles. Um, I think the food is, tastes Thai and it, it has a sort of Thai aesthetic, but I think when people see the list of ingredients that maybe go into the dishes, they're a bit surprised that they're managing to yeah. eat that um, and it be a Thai flavoured dish. Yeah. Essentially, it's like Thai dishes cooked with British produce. Yeah. Um, and on the, the kind of the Thai side, you, you go back to Thailand and you went when you when you can. How important is that for you as the chef that you are to go and like ex- still find new things, still explore new flavours and techniques? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I try and get out at least once a year. It's been a bit too long this time around because of recent events. But um, it's always interesting to go back and touch base with what's happening there. I think Bangkok especially is, is it, it's exploding there right now. Like, there's various reasons why. Michelin, I think, was one of them and it gave an empowerment level to young Thai chefs, domestic Thai chefs in the country who are now like striving to really present their... Um, present their cuisine on the top, top level, which never really happened before. Um, But yeah, I I always find inspiration going back, but equally so, I eat in a lot of restaurants domestically and find a lot of inspiration in that as well. Anglo Thai, let's talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, I know that having known you a few years, I know you've been looking at sites, you've had sites in mind, and then it's not been right. So how hard is it to find a permanent site for something that's obviously so, so uh, close and, and, and special to you. And you obviously have a vision for what that's going to be. And also, um, kind of following on for that, how hard is it to be successful in a city like London that is just jam-packed with restaurants? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's still changing and adapting all the time what this concept is and how we want to present it. Um, in its final incarnation, or at least in its first sort of bricks and mortar incarnation, because we've been, well, I know I've been sort of roaming around for pushing nearly two years, cooking all over the place. And every time I I kind of pop up, I try and force myself to cook a different style menu with things that people haven't eaten before. So it does turn quite relentless in the changing and adapting of what the style is. I think there is an undercurrent of what people expect from Anglo Thai in terms of what they eat. And I I really feel 
um, that people are starting to realize and, and understand what the style of food is that I cook. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I, I, it was difficult to find sites. I'm pretty sure it'll be a much easier exercise now. Um, I think the main thing for my wife and I was desi- deciding which area of London that we were wanting to kind of open up in. I know we've had a lot of deep discussions about our neighborhood Battersea because I've lived here on and off for about 11 years now when I haven't been in Thailand or abroad. I've, I've just lived here in Battersea and I love it. I think it's got great community and it sorely needs a big injection of kind of interesting restaurants to kickstart possibly a little kind of microclimate here. I definitely feel that there is the um, need for it, but also there are the demographic of people that will come to those kind of places. But I, I said to my wife before, it's, it, I don't mind being early to the party, but when you throw the party, it's quite, it's kind of a different, a different story. Yeah. <laughs> and seen plenty of good sites in Battersea, but then you kind of think, well, why is it so cheap? And why aren't people being successful in these sites? And when you dig a little bit deeper, you realize that no one's really managed to open in this neighborhood yet and kind of turn that over. And, and it, the more that you've sort of worked on your project by yourself, the more that you realize that it is quite a hard exercise to create a company that's going to be successful. And if you maybe just went a little bit more central where there's immediate traffic or there's an easier connection to being able to get to that site, then you're giving yourself maybe a little bit more of an advantage in terms of having a sustainable business model. Um, I think we are gravitating towards thinking about Battersea again. It feels like now in this time that neighborhoods are doing relatively well and central London is non-existent. Yeah. Um, It's hard to say now really where we think it, it falls for us and, how it's going to be. I haven't, I haven't really gone out into the market and had a look at what's available and what price people are asking for now. Cause I know definitely pre prior to this, you know, uh, prices were pretty high and, uh, there was very little on offer. Um, it's hard to say for that in terms of where we might end up, but yeah, in terms of competition in this city, I think it's probably one of the most interesting and diverse cities to eat out in the entire world. I still think that London probably has the edge now. I think it's really, um, it's really ballooned and grown in such an interesting way the last sort of five to 10 years. And you can pretty much get any kind of cuisine here cooked by original natives of that country or at least have heritage in it. And for me, I'm still like learning about new cuisines all the time when I go out and eat and and try these things. Luckily, I think we've managed to carve a tiny little niche in the market in terms of what we offer. But yeah, it's still very difficult to run the margins you need to. And I don't know what the long term future would look or what long term model would look for us because of the nature of how we pop up and cook. I think there's an excitement in that and it makes us busy. But whether if that you say like now we're open, would 18 months down the line, would we still be as busy as we are when we do kind of these pop-up or residency events or very hard ambiguous questions to answer um, <laughs> very early in the morning <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I do think it's really really nice that you said that one thing that you're really proud of is Anglo Thai because it's still such a young concept um, but it also it's something that obviously you can do with Diz with, with your wife which I know you've always wanted to try and do together and now you are doing it together so um, I'm, I, I was really pleased to read that that was the thing that you were most proud of so because um, I just think it's, it's lovely because it, I know that it's going to grow so much more than what it already is. No oh, thanks yeah I mean it, it is probably the thing that consumes well now it definitely consumes both of our lives as much as you can comfortably and mentally let it uh, <laughs> you know we are just like a husband and wife team and we do every single aspect of the business um, and it's not just in the kitchen in front of house and choosing wines it's all your own marketing we do all of our this is like a graphic designer before she came into this so a lot of all of our PR and marketing, she does it all. Um, I do all our finance work with my background. But, you know, you end up working very, very long days when you do that. 
but it's rewarding because you know every aspect of your company. But prior to um, prior to COVID, actually, Desiri was working full time for for another company, but she was made redundant. So we kind of looked at it after a few weeks and said, maybe this is again the silver lining. Maybe this is the time when we just go for it and see what we can make of this and like look at it as an opportunity rather than a negative. And it's been great since then. And we've done a few bits and bobs that have opened the doors to other things. And I think ultimately has led us to this path at Newcomer where we were originally going to cook for a few weeks, which has turned into a few months, which has then turned into a few more months. Um, And it's, yeah, it's been crazy. The demand has been amazing. Uh, and the, and the response has been fantastic. So I count ourselves very lucky that we have that and we're able to do this and give something back to the community. Yeah, yeah. And um, on that, obviously, this this coronavirus for you, and like you're saying, is that you've taken a positive out of what had happened and obviously lockdown and everything like that, which I think you have to really in this situation, you have to kind of take the positives out of it. But coronavirus, lockdown, reopening, um, three things at the start of this year that you probably uh, didn't think as a chef you'd be dealing with or as an actual person in real life <laughs> didn't think that you'd be dealing with those kind of yeah. circumstances. So it, um, those are the positives that you've, you've taken from, from the situation. Um, but yourself looking in on it or looking back on it and looking forward, um, what what has it done for the for the industry i mean it's obviously we, we both have a lot of friends in the industry and a lot of people can't come back from this in their like you know with the restaurants that they had originally i'm sure they will come back at some capacity what's it what's it been like for you um well i think it's really just exposed how fragile the hospitality industry is um you know it it was already a struggle to make ends meet and prior to this and I think that has only amplified even more it's yeah it is quite upsetting to see because I think a lot of people won't come back from it and I still think a lot of public perception is that oh it's not that bad surely these restaurants will be fine but it's not that it's just not as simple as that you know people pay astronomical rents in London and if they don't make the numbers that they need to which are still quite high um then they won't be paying those rents. They won't be able to pay their staff. They won't be able to pay their suppliers. And it slowly trickles down to realizing that a lot of the chains that are essential to make these restaurants run just can't function because people aren't doing the amount of covers and the business that they need to. Um, Yeah, I I think it's just going to be a very hard time where people take stock and rebuild themselves slowly from the ground up. It feels like people are kind of, falling back a little bit from fine dining, still offering a very high quality product, but maybe in a more casual approach and setting. I certainly know that that's what's happening for us at the moment. Um, And maybe fine dining is still going to exist, but I I don't see it myself at the moment. I just don't see a huge market for it outside of the billionaires and people that I have no touch with at all. Yeah. I think for the modern day, everyday person, it's all about getting something affordable, but quality, um, kind of like casual fine dining, I guess people kind of call it now. Um, I'm hoping people and public will be a bit more sympathetic to, you know, restaurants causes now. It's, you know, it's, a re- it's so, such a difficult time. Like, do you really know how you should be conducting yourself in terms of like protective gear and cleaning tables and space and the government has been fairly wishy-washy about it all so we've been okay we have an outdoor space that we cook in and I think people generally feel quite safe and comforting from that but I know that others have really struggled and I I, especially places in like Soho um, like friends like Kiln for example another Thai restaurant that is fantastic is I feel possibly just a bit of a victim of its own success. You know, the kind of Russell Norman Polpo model, get as many people in to as a small a space as possible and turn them over as fast as you can was great at that time prior to this. But now like that model is completely blown up. It doesn't exist anymore. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that will struggle because that isn't possible. And I doubt it will be again for at least until a vaccine, but also I don't know, like maybe I'm, I'm thinking like a year to 18 months and that's a long time to not be able to function your business in the way that you've 
worked out the numbers. Um, and that's, yeah, it's quite a scary thought to think about that. Yeah, um, I was going to ask you actually what your kind of, has hospitality or has the restaurant industry changed forever? Like, is this just a, like a new kind of dawn now? This is, this is how it is. I, I honestly don't know. I just try and take every, each week as it comes and just sort of focus on that and making sure that we do everything we can to kind of make people feel as comfortable and safe as possible while also delivering like a, as high quality product as we possibly can and give people that sense of normality, but obviously with um, precautions and doing it sensibly. Um, I've seen in places like the south of France and Spain and stuff and everyone's just going berserk, but like, is that the right way to be doing it? I'm not completely sure. And I don't think we feel comfortable doing that. I, th I think maybe, yeah, you're right. Like restaurants would have changed forever. I've seen a, n a number of kind of quality restaurants that have been around for ages have said that they're not going to reopen again. Like the lead roof, for example, it's like, that was a well, real shock, wasn't it? It that was a big like, shock to the yeah. system when you see that and you think like, wow, these are, huge established restaurants with amazing credentials you know top 50 restaurants in the world and then they're like oh yeah we, we're not going to come back from this and that's pretty you know it's pretty interesting to see because you're like maybe that is the best option for these people they're just saying you know what? it's not it's not worth us fighting it out for another 10 years to get back to where we were like cut it off at, at this point is probably better and we can adapt and look to do something different i think the thing that's been good for us is because we move around and we we chop and change and in our current home at newcomer wines no one's ever cooked there really before so there's no expectation on us no one knows what is they should be coming to whereas for other restaurants like somewhere like somsar i know when they opened they were feeling quite nervous about it because there is a certain expectation of it's quite a bustling place it's quite a fun place like yeah, would it hold yeah. the same atmosphere if people are kind of like all put away from each other and they put like screens up and everything and it just I think it very much changes the psychological um, ambience of the room and the restaurant and I've actually not yet been there I, I, I'm looking to go at some point soon but I'm I know that I think a few people are sort of worried about that that style of things yeah it's something actually that I've been um, local out a couple of times but I've kind of forgotten about so you sit down you get in there and you kind of forget that you know like music can't be that loud and you've got to be so far away from people and there's a you know the, all these different systems that are in place until you're actually physically in the place and yeah goes oh yeah it's changed like it's not it's not going to be like it was before at the moment so it's really it's definitely, it's, really pretty, it's definitely pretty weird like scanning an app on your phone and then ordering from there and then paying for your bill and then someone comes and brings over your food and you tip and pick it off a tray and you're like, wow, this is super weird. Yeah. But yeah. I like, I don't, uh, we, I've only been out a handful of times. Um, and even then it has felt a little bit strange and I don't think public confidence is quite where it needs to be. Um, but we'll see. I think it will be a slow road back to where we need to get. And hopefully the, the support will be in place to make that happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is, it's definitely a tough time, probably the toughest time the industry's ever seen and many industries as well. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And speaking of it being a tough time, I just wanted to ask you as well about no-shows because that has been a big thing. Uh, it's come back to the forefront, not that it, I mean, it only went away because restaurants had to shut. It's always been an issue. It's not like it's a new issue. Um, so how do you feel about that and, and how do you think that we deal with it? Because it feels a bit like... You know, we're trying to support the industry and if people are still doing that it's like come on <laughs> give them a break yeah. so. I, just, I just think it's completely um put completely disgusting behavior really and i think it, there's no reason for it uh i'm glad that some of the big boys like tom carriage and paul ainsworth are really talking about it hard now and i think that's put the discussion onto a bit more of a public platform i know that a few people that weren't so aware of it have definitely mentioned it to us and we ourselves have just addressed the problem for ourselves like quite immediately. We only take pre-bookings and pre-payment to secure your table. And if you don't pay, then we give your table to someone else. And that's kind of as cut and dry as it gets. We kind of got stung. The first couple of weeks was fine. I think 
we weren't doing the numbers that we're doing now and we didn't have as much demand because people didn't really know we were there and what we were doing. But what, by week three, um, and there's a few examples actually, Desiri would like send a confirmation email out and then you don't hear anything back and then she'd send another one, don't hear anything back. And then sort of the night before we'd send it out and just be like, just checking if you're coming or not. And people would reply with things like, oh, it slipped my mind to actually say that we're not coming and that's a table of six cancelled on you, 300 quid, and you may not fill it. And we have three tables. So it's kind of, it does cut you pretty deep when that happens. And luckily we haven't been in a situation where we haven't been able to fill those slots. But now we just took a lot more of an aggressive stand to it. And just, we were just very transparent with people as well and said, look, people are doing this and like not coming back to us fast enough. And we are constantly turning people away for tables. So we get it and we're like reasonable people and we know that people's plans change. So just let us know and we can like move your booking or we can cancel it. It's fine. But to just not tell the restaurant, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It just seems like pretty rude behavior really. Yeah. And it's a very strange culture because I mean, for me, I was, it wouldn't bother me if I prepaid or gave my card details because I have every intention of going to the restaurant. So for me, it's only an issue if you have no intention of going. So it's, yeah, it's a very, it's really strange that people seem to think that that's okay. So. Yeah. I mean, it's the same as when you buy the cinema ticket, isn't it? Or like a theatre ticket and stuff like that. You don't just book the seat in the theatre and then don't turn up and then, you know, they, or even like a gig ticket or something like people expect you to pay up front and that's always been the culture. So don't see if it's any, why it's any different with people giving their time and energy and efforts to do something that is a bit more of like, I guess, an entertainment quantity as well as a food and drinks thing. But someone said something interesting to me the other day about almost selling it as this like prepaid experience that maybe it is turning into a bit more of that expectation now that you're not just going out for dinner, you're going out for like hearing about the things on the menu and why they're important and why these wines match and why those kind of style restaurants are maybe even more relevant than they've ever been before as as opposed to kind of just like, I don't know, Cafe Rouge, pop in, get your whatever you get in Cafe Rouge because I don't know, and then leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're definitely right. I think, it, it, you know, everything's changed and it is, it is an experience. Um, and I just really hope that people can change their kind of mentality on it. So um, talking of eating out, um, I did ask you your worst and your best meal. And I knew you wouldn't tell me what your worst meal was because you're just too nice. I knew you wouldn't say it. Um, so, but your best meal, um, which I, I do agree with because I've been there as well, is uh, at Penson's when Lee Westcott was there. Um, you said that was a, a banger of a meal to quote. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so, so talk me through that and, and you know, why, why you enjoyed it so much. Um... I can't, I, like, I do always struggle to just like pick out like what was my favorite meal or best meal. I've had some like super interesting meals in Thailand before, yeah. but would I say like they're the best meal I've ever eaten? Maybe not. Um, As in you've eaten some strange and oh, I've eaten some real strange shit before. But, What's the strangest thing you've had? Um, last time I was in Thailand, I ate a raw buffalo and it's offal and blood and bile larb. So like all hand minced together with loads of aggressive dry spice mix and herbs. Wow. Um, yeah, it's pretty full on. It's actually edible, which was surprising. Enjoyable? Sort of okay. I don't know if I'd <laughs> rush to do it again. Um, it's, that's kind of the vibe in the north of Thailand, like north, yeah, northern provinces above Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, a lot of kind of, raw meat chopped salads they call it in quotation marks um very aggressive flavors quite like man food that gets drunk with a lot of um cow lao which is like sort of home brewed moonshine rice wine wow yeah it's pretty cool. full-on stuff <laughs> but um yeah going back to penson's i've known lee for quite a while actually he's one of the first people i met in the industry when i um returned to London and we've we just got on straight away I really liked him and I've kind of followed him 
and his journey as well while he's been in London. I think he was at Typing Room at that time and I've eaten there many times and always enjoyed it. Um, And I know that we chatted a lot before he moved to Pensons because if people don't know, it's actually a bit out in the sticks. Between very like, out in the sticks. Yeah, Not it's very. Yeah. <laughs> between Wor- Worcestershire and Herefordshire, <laughs> which is quite close to where I went to school and grew up, not too far from Wales. Um, so I know that area and I know there's nothing there. And I know the kind of people that probably live in those villages. And I um, know that that does not suit Mr. Lee Westcott down to a T at all. So I was quite curious to see that he'd moved there. And I, I, I'd eaten there a few times. Um, and I think, yeah, the last time was last year. He'd won a Michelin star, which I know he was always trying to work towards, which I was so happy for him that he achieved that. And I was fortunate enough that I was going back to see my mum the following day or the day after that. And I just booked in on a whim for the service. He was back there and I could just feel like the level of execution and the level of cooking had taken that extra notch. And don't get me wrong. I thought typing room was deserved of a star the whole time, but there was something very special about this. And he's probably cooking with that extra shine of confidence on himself as well after getting that accolade and I just remember it just being like a very effortlessly superb meal everything tasting delicious everything looking great um the service was quality the wines were great and yeah it just stood out to me that he'd really kind of achieved the 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 sort of top end scale that he was always questing for and I, I was really happy for him at that time as well um He's now just sitting around doing nothing, so... Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've seen. <laughs> wasted there. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was a really good meal. He's, he's a very good he seasonal... He just put in his spa so he could retire, didn't he? That's all exactly. <laughs> so, um, what... Let's go off a little bit here. So, you did... You've obviously mentioned um, <laughs> different ingredients and things, but what ingredients do you really, really love? Um, I wish that maybe other chefs appreciated and used more as well is there, is there anything you can think of I don't know really because I tend to try and work with seasonal stuff that a lot of British chefs work with and I take a lot of inspiration from that I think I used to eat at Lyle's a lot when it was um when I was at Somsa when we first opened as a pop-up because it was kind of just down the road and I would I'd actually eat a lot of lunches there by myself and I took a lot of inspiration from James's food that kind of minimalist approach two or three things on a on a dish and um, always like very seasonal, highly thought out chosen produce. So I, I, you know, at the moment we're cooking with like gooseberries and um, what else are we cooking with? Can't even remember. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it all just blurs into one. Uh, it does all blur into one. Uh, crab, I think at the moment it's been on the menu just because it's very highly in season. But I. I think for me, I, I, stuff I can't live without, fish sauce probably is the main one it's yeah. in everything. Um, I try and use like a lot of umami ingredients that come from Southeast Asia that maybe I don't feel, you know, if something's sitting in a bottle or a, or a pot that is kind of like, a, I guess, a dry store ingredient. I know it's coming over in boats and in, the, in freights and things. And I, I don't feel like those air miles I feel that affect as affected by as maybe someone picking an apple in the farther nether regions of Bangkok and then bringing it over and then I cook with it two weeks later if it's got got off the boat that just feels a bit minging to me (laughs) um I I I don't know really which ingredients I would try and encourage other other chefs to to use I think it's just mainly just look at what is around you and seasonal and close to you and and just go for that rather than again like I don't feel like what we touched upon I don't feel like you need to use Thai ingredients to make Thai food and I think my family in Bangkok would say and mirror those sentiments as well um it yeah for me it is just like an ethos of the way that you season your food which is quite drastically different from the style of western seasoning um and you know for example there's a salad in Thailand called a som tum which means sour pounded and it's always usually some incarnation of uh, green papaya used as like the main bulk of the salad and the reason for that is papayas are super abundant in Thailand and one of the things that 
uh, they do in Thai cuisine is they use a lot of vegetables or particularly fruits in their green or like unripe stage because they have a bit more of a savory quality to them. But um, green papaya in the UK costs something like nine pound a kilo, which is incredibly expensive when you think a carrot is probably like 50p a kilo. Yeah. Um, and also green papaya has no flavor at all and is just like a texture <laughs> thing. Okay. So when we make some palm in the UK or when I make it, I tend to try and gravitate towards using carrots or root vegetables or beetroots or something that holds a bit more provenance here, but also I think has bags more flavor. And that's the kind of like substitute that I go for really. Um, it still holds like the same texture and you know, it, it cuts the same as a green papaya, but it, has for me more flavor and I think is more delicious. And actually that's the kind of thing where when I speak to my family in Thailand, they're like, yeah, well, we wouldn't just import green papaya to make a song tam in, in the UK. It wouldn't make any sense. That's like a very unresourceful way of cooking Thai cuisine and not using your surroundings. Um, so for me, I think, uh, you know, if we're talking about what ingredient chefs should be using, it should just be like domestic ingredients and really champion your local produce. Now, I said at the beginning of this, obviously, I, I love your food. Your food's amazing and I'm always blown away every time I have it. So um, I thought I loved the fact that you did um, Great British Menu and you could showcase <laughs> that to some extent. I know Great British Menu is uh, is not the same as, as being in your own in your own place and doing your own thing. Um, it's not as easy or as simple or how it looks on the telly. I know everything goes a lot behind the scenes as well, but so how was Great British Menu? And, you know, was that something that you thought you would always want to do or is it kind of a, you know, it's great for, you know, projecting yourself into the public eye and raising your profile as well, as well as being part of, you know, some amazing chefs who have been on that programme? Mm. Um... I mean, no, I'd, I'd never like thought I would be invited on the show or think that I would be of that kind of like level that, or I still don't really think I am, but like at least, you know, there's a lot of, like you say, the alumni of people that have gone through that show and some of the early seasons, you know, they're some of the biggest names in the industry, really. Yeah. So it's super, super humbling to be kind of, even have my name amongst those those guys and, and, and women. Um, when I got when I got the message, I think actually the the producer messaged me over Instagram, and I was like, nah, fuck that. That's just someone <laughs> to have a joke. <laughs> no way. Don't even have a restaurant. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I actually really enjoyed it. I kind of do like doing things a bit out of the ordinary, and I I feel that again with like having this kind of convoluted career that spans all kinds of things is you sort of. I do enjoy not having to do the repetition of the day to day. I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm born to be in a kitchen really. I don't think I could be like a line cook, sort of do the same thing every single day and quest to cook the same dish better than you did the last day. I kind of like, right, like make the dish, love it, put it on the menu, cook it for a few weeks and then go, okay, I don't want to look at that ever again, actually. <laughs> Else to do it now. But um, yeah, it was a great experience. It was uh, definitely an eye-opening experience. TV is 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 a different kind of industry for sure. It's very, um, I th I'd say the main thing is it's very mentally draining. You know, you've got people with, you've got like dedicated camera crew on you the whole time. You're mic'd up the whole time. It's very long days, but we're used to that as chefs, but not in the capacity of, you know, sort of having to, be very switched on in your head to not be just saying absolute garbage to people the whole time. <laughs> I think I managed to not do that, which was a bonus. Um, and actually, yeah, you probably only cook for about two, three hours in maybe like a 15 hour day. So that kind of puts it into perspective of like all the, can you talk about this? And there's a lot of like reshooting, just you talking on camera so that they have enough to be able to edit it together as like a complete program. Um, I enjoyed it. Would it could have gone again? better for me. But, uh, I would do it again. I think I've, I've definitely learned the lessons I have to from that. And I feel even like 
the seasoning and the spice levels of what I've been putting on the menu at Newcomer has definitely mirrored some of the comments that I got from the show. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I think, I think you have to just take it under consideration. And I do feel confident about how I cook and what I cook. And one of the things that I set out to do when I went on the show is I didn't really want to compromise too much on my style, if at all. And I really didn't want to have to like bend the way that I cook just to kind of fit the format of the show. I think if I went on again, I would do that more so. But yeah, potentially some of the ways I season things aren't appealing to the masses at times. <laughs> uh, so I've taken that into consideration, definitely. Um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a great experience. And I've like made Tom Phillips particularly, uh, who I cooked against, he's become a good friend. And, you know, I thought he was an amazing chef, but if not, probably the best chef I've ever been in a kitchen with, which was you know, quite in, uh, amazing in itself that you can watch someone of that level cook around you and just be at awe at everything they're doing. If you weren't like in the shit the whole time, I'd probably just stand over him <laughs> watching him cook the whole time. But he'd like come to the past and be like, oh, I've made this twill red out of potatoes that looks like a Victorian tablecloth. I'm like, right, I don't do that. That's mental. Mind blown. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, wow, I thought I knew something about cooking, but this guy really knows something about cooking. <laughs> that's, no, it's good, that's, it's like, that's exciting, it, though. Yeah, I think it definitely... I wasn't too sure about going on, to be honest, and I spoke with, with Diz, my wife, and she just said, look, you know, you've got nothing to lose. Actually, you, the probably the other people you'll be cooking against, will, you know, they all have restaurants at least, and they probably all hold some kind of accolade over you. So you can go in there and just do what you do and maybe just shared a little bit more of an interesting insight into a different cuisine that's never been seen before on the show. So that was really great. And I think, um, I mean, just from the week that it aired, I was kind of like lucky, I guess, in some respect that it was sort of the, the height of lockdown. And I think the viewership was through the roof at that point. So I had a lot of people messaging me over sort of social media platforms saying how much they loved the food. And they were asking about when we were going to be cooking next and when they'd be able to book in and come and taste the food and stuff. And actually, I think the first few weeks at Newcomer, most people have come to me and like, oh, yeah, I saw you on TV. We really wanted to come try your food. So it's definitely obviously helped spark something that's made us a bit more popular than we were before. Yeah. And that's I'm quite thankful for that in so many ways because it is essentially free exposure, really. Um, and, yeah, it's just it's nice. My mum really liked it as well. So that's all. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> She's telling all her friends that you were on the telly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She, she had to keep strong for such a long time. And then she's like, why can I tell everyone that you're going to be on the telly? Like, <laughs> With that in mind, um, and like you said, take the taking from that, that you know, it is free exposure and it's amazing for you guys going forward. What yeah. is the dream, John? Like what, what is, you know, when you look back yeah. in like 20, 30 years, be like, yeah, this is what, this is what I wanted to achieve when I did it. What's, what's the dream? Um, I think we're just looking to build something quite humble, but a company that is like stands on its own two legs and is sustainable and will have a future for, you know, us to be able to have a family and be able to pass that down to our children and say like, look, we've made a business from scratch. We know every aspect of it. It generates a profit and, uh, you can choose to work here or be a part of it, or you don't have to, but it's something that you know has relevance in the industry and we're very proud of and um you know just the fact that you can dictate your own hours and choose to do what you want to do and put out your personality on a plate or an atmosphere or a bottle of wine i think that's something really nice and rewarding from that just um yeah just from kind of I don't know. It's it's sort of it's sort of weird. I don't really quest for accolades in my head. I think I know the style of food that I cook and how it makes me happy. And actually, just being able to form relationships with suppliers and have chats with them and know that they know the kind of food that I cook now, so they'll suggest I like products that 
they think maybe are like, and I can put that on a menu. And it's, I think the thing about this industry, it's, it's very full circle. You sort of buy something, prep it, put it on a menu, sell it to a customer, customer either likes it or dislikes it, hopefully doesn't dislike it, uh, pays for it. And it's like, that's the whole loop done in a day. And you just, there's no, no kind of like having to wait around for the rep, like, the satisfaction part of it. I know that some of the office things I've done before you work on projects for like years and then you might not even get to work on that project or see the end of it. And it's very unsatisfactory, I guess, in that respect. And yeah. I think I get a very closed loop satisfaction from cooking and doing what we do. Okay. Um, and gratification. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think for us, we just, we, my wife and I, we just enjoy working together and, it gives us an excuse to hang out all the time and what we're trying to build is something that will allow us to not just be serving food but we have a big interest in in wine and i think if we can get ourselves into a position where we have something that works and people can cook the food and we can sort of explore new avenues like go on trips to europe and maybe discover winemakers and import their wines and have them on the menus with us here just that kind of stuff I find quite exciting. It allows you to travel, um, travel for food and drink, which is the thing that I ultimately love doing in my life. I think yeah. food and yeah, food and drink is probably my favorite thing there is. Um, I'm quite basic in that respect. And if you get to add a little bit of travel into that as well, it's always fun and exciting. And then I do it with my, with my partner in crime, my wife. So it's kind of just very easy going living in a yeah. lot of respects. I feel like you're living the dream already, which is a... a in some a, respect. <laughs> until you realise that you're like working every day and just <laughs> not achieving anything you need to every day. But it's great. I mean, like, it's it, there's something about it that's quite nice at this time and scale. Like, you know, with the bookings with Newcomer, we, we decided to take it in-house because it just made a bit more sense because we didn't really know how we were going to be able to deal with the situation on an ad hoc basis based on like government guidelines and everything is changing so much from week to week. Yeah. So now we're like speaking to these, these potential guests, each one and people come in and be like, Oh yeah, I chatted to you on email. Thanks for booking us in. And there's already a rapport there that has started something that they, I think feel that they've got a bit of an experience already. And then, then they come and realize, Oh, it is just me and Diz. Diz is doing wines and running food and I'm cooking and we're both right there in front of them. They're like, wow, that's cool that these guys are doing this. And they, I think it makes a lot of sense to people at that point. It's not just like a system of going through, um, yeah, like systems, like booking systems to no one and getting an email back from no one. And then suddenly you turn up and I don't know. I, I think that there's a, a lot of hospitality in what we offer and what we do. And that's really nice to be in touch with that and do it on that scale that it's still um, possible to do it. Yeah. I think it's really nice. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's great that you're really, really busy. And I think that's a, a nice positive way to kind of end our chat. Um, and good luck with uh, everything going forward. And obviously your guest chefs, I'm sure they will all be booked out as well and uh please 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 do let me know as soon as you do have a permanent site because i've been waiting for so long <laughs> we'll need all the support we can we can take at that point <laughs> but yeah thank you so much for chatting to me um and um i'm sure i will speak to you soon so yeah thanks very much for having me on it's been a pleasure we hope you enjoyed this interview and if you have any comments feel free to tweet us or comment on the post uh, we're making all of our interviews available to download and finally if you like what we do whether it's our podcast or our videos or even our features please head over to our patreon page and support us there this episode of grilled by the staff canteen is sponsored by westlands the premier specialist british grower of micro leaf growing cresses edible flowers inspired leaves sea herbs and specialty tomatoes visit www.westlandsuk.co.uk to find out more